So when you take that frame of reference, it completely shatters the political system, it shatters the business system as we know it, it shatters this notion of free choice. I say that in a very subtle way because when it comes down to it, we are not free. If we intend to survive on this planet, we have to align ourselves with the laws of nature and guide ourselves, and that's that. And that's a deep problem we have with the neuroses of freedom we have in the world today. But no one actually knows how to effectively shovel resources from the minority that, that controls almost everything to the majority that has almost nothing in any consistent way. But Peter, it comes back to who's going to make that decision. Yes. So, like, I, I sometimes kiddingly, somewhat kiddingly, uh, call myself on the show the most reasonable man in America. Okay. okay, so do I get to make the decisions? A democracy in and of itself implies a finding a way to get people to work together and share the world and share decision-making processes, right? Right. Yep. Okay, well, a democracy could be that everyone in the world decides to kill themselves. Well, then that's their choice to do so. Yep. It could be that everyone in the world decides to enslave a whole group of people. That's fine. It could be decided that everyone in the world, in their ignorance, decides to destroy the whole planet because of bad methods, because they're not willing to align themselves with natural laws, such as, say, climate destabilization, depletion, all the other things that are happening in the world today. So that means democracy needs something else. It needs a guiding, a guiding educational principle. It needs a frame of reference to make the democratic process reasonable, because otherwise it's just monkeys in the wild. It all begins with reason, with the realization that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion. Faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, Parsing of sacred texts are all ways of being wrong. Okay, but who gives that? Well, like I'm, your I'm, reason I'm can be can be different than my reason, and you know, look, I, I'm an but, enormous believer in logic, and I sure. and I'm agnostic, and I don't believe in religion. That's a whole separate problem because we've got to overcome the fact that the world is massively religious. And that's a great point. But who decides what's reasonable? Well, let me let me. Reason, in contrast, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to pro provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you try to persuade someone why you're right, why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. To finish my point is we have to create a system of interaction of humanity where everyone decides. Mm -hmm. Now, what I mean by that is we have, we have this thing called a, a, a direct democracy. It's very common now. It's, mm -hmm. it's used in technical circles. Mm -hmm. We apply the concept of direct, direct democracy, except it isn't people seeing a referendum. It isn't people voting on something. It's actually about the true established element of society that keeps us going, which is industry itself, not politics. Politics is a, is a byproduct. It's, it's really, at its deepest core, it's really a, a negative retroaction of, a, of an economic system that's so inefficient, it needs these people up here to control everything in their dictatorial way. So in a future, you're going to have an interactive system of some kind where people are going to contribute to the development of goods, of life support. They're going to contribute to the management of the earth, contribute to their own betterment in just the way we do today, except against a technical benchmark of scientific, the scientific method and reason. The view on socialism and the way people brand the movement as socialist. Okay. okay. What do you think is the best way to, to, to counter that common problem? Laws that the dynamic, the dialectic of history, which propelled us towards the in inevitable proletarian revolution. You just identify it and make them realize that the distinction <clears throat> moot is what I would say. Socialism is defined as most because you get a lot of definitions, but most, in, the most, in the most average context, socialism is defined as the means of production owned by anything but private organizations. It's hard, it's like the, the whitewashing of what happened in the, in the, in the Soviet states, you know, in the communist states in the 20th century. I mean, mm. anybody who goes through that literature with any degree of care comes away Traumatized, right? Shell shocked. Mm. And yet, I see with my students. Fifty for or example, sixty million people who dared to disagree died. Oh, well, at minimum, it was in it their was, own culture. Mm -hmm, it was something in their own society. We don't know. In, in the Soviet Union, the estimates range from twenty to sixty million, and mm. in Maoist China, the estimates are as much as a hundred million. Are our right, kids so, taught this in school? No, not at all. In universities? Mm. Why not? Very. But the important thing, as far as this presentation is concerned, is. How do the communists define it? And this is where many people are surprised to learn that the communists have an entirely different meaning for the word socialism than the average American has. Did you know that there isn't a single communist country in existence anywhere on earth? 
That's right. Not one. Russia isn't a communist country. Red China isn't. Cuba certainly isn't. These are socialist lands. That's how communist leaders always describe them. I think you see, their societies, they, this before preface yeah. something, the modern fight, in, in, it seems to me, in many ways, is between what might be called freedom and fairdom, uh, fairness yeah. and equality. Mm -hmm. Equality sounds terrific. Yeah. But we've actually seen what happens in societies well, where they set equality up yeah. as the ultimate goal. They became yeah. terrible places. Yeah. Well, How did is, that happen? Well, I think this is it part of the It sounds good. Yeah, well, that's, I think that's also part of the, the whitewashing is we can't understand how one of our primary moral intuitions, which might be fairness, let's say, can transform itself into something so utterly murderous when it's played out on a large political stage. And I think because we don't understand that, I mean, look, there's reasons to be on the left. You see, according to the teachings of Karl Marx, communism will come to this world only in some future utopian era, when men will have learned to live together in perfect harmony. And what are they preaching? What do they want? Socialism, so that nobody else has the opportunity to become what they've become. This system's rigged. This system is not a pure system. Again, I go back to my meritocracy point. When they'll want to share equally with their fellow human beings and have nothing better than anyone else. And the bloody intellectuals come into the town and they say, you know those successful farmers up the street that you've always been pretty jealous about? When they'll no longer be greedy or competitive. Because that's just huge being jealous. Every single dollar in all of your wallets is owed to somebody by somebody. And this again leads us into the heart of the disease. The economic monetary based system or the game as I like to call it. What happens when you play Monopoly? One person ends up with all the money. Because that's all it is. All right, then you play another game of Monopoly. What happens? That's all it ever was, a game. One person ends up with all the money. And we can change the game anytime we want. If we all play that long enough, one person will end up with all the money and everyone else will end up with zero. We just need to convince those who are winning the game to put down their pieces for a moment and ask themselves if the game they are playing is really going to reward them in the long run. It's actually the inevitable consequence of multiple trades that are conducted randomly. Do you really think that we're going to get away with just randomly printing more and more money in the central banks and expect no inflationary repercussions or debt collapse repercussions? Remember, all money comes into existence from loans. 15 people on the planet have got as much accumulative wealth as the poorest 5 billion. So it's a deeply built feature of systems of creative production and no one really knows what to do about it. In a talk I did called uh, Where Are We Going, I described a ground up global approach to a network organization uh, which is in fact a resource-based economy. And I describe why the parameters are what they are. Because of course the danger is, is that all the resources get funneled to a tiny minority of people at the top and a huge section of the population stacks up at zero. They're the ones that are pushing for so, yes, That's not real are. Well, are you kidding? But to blame that on the oppressive nature of a given system is to radically underestimate the complexity of the problem. When this comes to pass, there will no longer be any need for police or for government of any kind. Who's your favorite radical journalist? I suppose I'd have to say George Orwell. I, I know it's cliched because everyone now pretends to admire him, but there was a long time when he wasn't well known and certainly not well liked. I thought he, I thought he put up a good show for the left in his life at a time when it was in great difficulty because people were pressed very hard to say, look, if you're on the left, you must support the Soviet Union because it's endangered and it's encircled by fascism. Uh, one critic has claimed that you cannot blow your nose without moralizing on conditions in the handkerchief industry. But were you such a political firebrand when George Orwell was invented in 1933? So on, and you mustn't criticize it in public even if you have your doubts. And he said, no, that, that would be stupid. That would be giving up the thing that makes me a radical in the first place, which is the right to think for myself. That was a lot harder to do now than it sounds again. I spent five years in an unsuitable profession, the Indian Imperial Police in Burma. I then underwent poverty and a sense of failure. This increased my natural hatred of authority, but these experiences were not enough to give me an accurate political orientation. Because that's just huge being jealous.
That's just you not liking the guy's house next door because it's bigger than your house. And look at that, he has a big house, I have a smaller house, maybe I'll just go rob his place. Because I think Orwell put his finger on it when he said that middle class socialists don't like the poor, they just hate the rich. Through the magic of the internet, it is possible for me to respond to Jordan Peterson. And then he said, the state will wither away. When that happens, said Marx, it will be communism. In the meantime, comrades, whenever we come to power, we shall call it socialism. George Soros doesn't want socialist policies. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, doesn't want socialist policies. They oh. want to make sure that no one else has the opportunity Look, to get to where they got. Let me explain what that means to you using a pizza analogy. You have a 10-slice pizza, and you have 10 of your friends come over, or 9 of your friends come over to make it a total of 10, including you. Somebody opens the box, and one of your friends takes 9 of the 10 slices. No matter who you are, when you hear that, you have to say, Oh, so this system's fucked. 